we have all seen examples of church bulletin bloopers. You know, uh, the, I remember the one with the church bulletin advertising the, the, the Weight Watchers group that met in the church. And they and encouraged them to make sure they used the large double-sized doors on the side of the building to enter. Um, We've had our own share over, over the years that I have been here. We've had a few. I remember one um, back in the day, and we caught it, actually. We printed all of the bulletins. They were ready to be you know, put out for Sunday, uh, but we caught it. One of the hymns, when we listed the, the hymns in the bulletin back in the day, um, one of them was misspelled, and it was um, a cuss word. And so um, it, uh, we, we threw all those bulletins away and reprinted them. Um, Another time, and this one did go public, it was in the newsletter, and it advertised what was supposed to be a pantry shower for a newlywed couple, but we advertised a panty shower. (laughs) And so at their their shower, that newlywed couple got a bunch of undergarments and, uh, you know, the fact is church correspondence is difficult, even when you know the recipients personally, So think about writing to Christians that you have never met in person and how particularly challenging that could be. That was the task facing the Apostle Paul when he wrote the letter, what we affectionately call the the epistle to the Colossians. Colossae was a town that Paul had never actually visited as far as we know. And to be honest, Colossae was probably the most unimportant town of all the churches that received letters in your New Testament. It really was not a very impressive place. It it wasn't a place that you would naturally go to if you're wanting to pick a major city to do some kind of evangelistic work in. The only reason that we know about Colossae was because a letter was written there. Apparently, the church was started when Paul had a a two-year stay in a nearby place called Ephesus. It said that he would lecture every day, and he, while he was there, would share the word of God, and it would go out all throughout that province in Asia. So apparently, people would come into Ephesus, this major city, they would hear the apostle Paul preach, and then they would go all over that province, and churches would get started. That is apparently how the church in Colossae got started. We know of at least two people who were converted by Paul in the city of Ephesus who lived in Colossae. One was a man named Philemon. We will talk some about him as we study through Colossians. Another was a man by the name Epaphras. It was Epaphras, we will learn, who went back to Colossae and planted the church in that city. He also apparently started churches in two other towns nearby, Laodicea and Hierapolis. Now, when we read Colossians, Epaphras is not in Colossae anymore. He is actually over in Rome. He started the church in Colossae and apparently he has come up against some new ideas and teachings that he did not know how to deal with. They are threatening the development of this young church. So he goes all the way over to Rome where his mentor, the man that brought him to Christ, the apostle Paul is in house arrest. So Paul writes this letter to his spiritual grandchildren. He didn't bring them to Christ, but he brought the man to Christ that brought them to Christ. He's never met them, but he loves them. And he sends them this letter. He gives that letter to two of his young favorites, a boy named Chichikis and another young man named Onesimus. Remember that name because we'll talk about him later as well. And these two young men take the letter all the way back to Colossae. So it opens up with these words, Colossians 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. And what follows that greeting is considered by many to be the most exalted picture of Jesus Christ in all of the New Testament. Now, 
Every single letter in your Bible is written to answer or deal with a particular question. And the question that the Colossians asked was crucial for their day, and it is imperative in our day as well. Here is the question that was being asked in Colossae. Is Christ enough, or do we need more? And I want you to remember this, because as we go through this. It's going to come up in every sermon that I preach as we study this great book. Underneath everything that Paul writes is this particular question. The church in Colossae was full of baby Christians, and every parent knows something. You know that conception is a lot easier than maturation. And I'm not downplaying, by the way, the whole uh, difficulty of birthing a baby, but birthing the baby is not nearly as difficult as raising and maturing the child. Now, the question you have to ask yourself if you are a young evangelist or a young missionary is, I've got all these new Christians. How do I bring them to spiritual maturity? And evidently, there were some people in Colossae who were saying some things along these lines. Well, Epaphras, he got you off to a good start. Christ is a a, a very good first step. But if you want to be really spiritual, then you need to listen to us because we, we have more that you need. There's still more you need to know and do. The one thing you have got to understand is that the doctrine of the complete sufficiency of Christ is often seen as simplistic and even offensive to human religion. Human religion is always going to want to add more to the work and person of Jesus. And let me tell you something else that you need to remember about heretics. Heretics do not come into the church saying, Christ not. They come in saying, Christ and. You must not operate under the misconception that heretics only look and sound like heretics. You see, the people in Colossae that are trying to supplement the gospel that Paul taught Epaphras to teach, they would insist that they are not denying the Christian faith. They are simply saying, we're elevating the Christian faith to a higher level. And if you know much about Paul, you know that Paul can handle a great diversity of opinion in the body of Christ. Just go and read Romans chapter 14 or 15. You know Paul is not going to pick a fight every single time somebody disagrees with him about a particular issue. But he will not tolerate diverse views about the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Paul will strongly oppose any path to Christ that that undermines the total adequacy and the total supremacy of Christ. You see, Christ and is a total contradiction to the gospel of grace. Let me show you two verses that are basically the very heart and theme of the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 says this, For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is head over every power and authority. Now, in your Bible, do me a favor as we read through, or as you you study the book of Colossians with me, every time you see the Apostle Paul use the word full or all, underline that in your Bible. He will use the word all over 30 times in this message. The point is, why do you need to listen to somebody else tell you how to get more if you already have all? Look at chapter 2, verses 2 and 4, 2 through 4. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. One thing that we are going to see in the weeks ahead is that a lot of the philosophy, a lot of the New Age ideology in our day is just the old heresy that Paul dealt with back in the first century. And we need to learn how to be able to recognize what Paul is calling fine-sounding 
arguments. He's going to later call the same thing philosophy based on human tradition. I call it Christ and. Let me show you three things that Christ and is going to produce. Write these down in your sermon sheet. Number one, Christ and says there are more like Christ. One thing that we are going to have to understand if we are going to appreciate this letter to the church in Colossae is the pervading worldview of the people who were becoming Christians in that particular day. You see, if you became a Christian in the city of Colossae, you had been taught all of your life that matter, this physical world, is evil. That's how they explained evil and suffering in the world. Matter is evil. Creation is evil. Well, how did creation get here if God is is all above that and good and holy? Well, what they came up with, this philosophy that, that out of God came these emanations, these beings that came out from God. And the further that they would get from God, the more evil they would become until finally one got far enough, one got evil enough that it created the whole world. And that's why there is evil in this world. And that's why God had nothing to do with it. Now, if you hear a philosophy like that, you should immediately recognize a problem with, you know, putting that together with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because we immediately, right off the bat, are going to have a problem with the doctrine of the incarnation. Because we Christians say, we believe God came to this world in the flesh. What these guys were doing is they were saying, you've got all these emanations that are between you and this holy God, but we know how to get past all of that so that you can get to God. Christ is good, but Christ is not enough. You need more than that if you want to get to God. You see, they would say that Christ was actually one of those emanations that came out from God. They might even say that Christ is the highest of the emanations It was not a view that denied Christ. It was a view that dethroned Christ. And if you've been listening to the philosophy of our day, you will hear that same old heresy. You will hear the Colossian heresy just kind of reworded. If you listen close, people say things like, Jesus is one of many ways to God. People will say things along the lines of, Jesus is a picture of humanity at its best. Paul says, I'm not going to have anything to do with that. I don't want to have anything to do with a condescended view of Christ. Paul said, Christ has all the fullness of the deity in him in bodily form. Look what he says in chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Listen, church, Christ is not first among equals. Christ is first and there are no equals. So what Paul is going to do is he is going to get to the philosophy in chapter 2, but you know what he does? The best way to deal with error is to just preach truth hard. So in chapter 1, Paul lifts up Christ and and exalts Christ in a way that gives everyone who reads chapter 1 just goosebumps. He's going to make sure you understand that Christ is first. There are no equals to Jesus. And he goes on and says in verse 22, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish, free from accusation. And what he is saying is that once you know Christ, there is nothing between you and this holy God. These guys in Colossae were saying Christ is good, but you need to know what we're going to teach so that you can get past all of the stuff between you and God. And Paul is saying, no, Christ took care of everything. That's between you and God. And if you are in Christ, you can go to the throne room of the Father in heaven. There is nobody else that you can say that about. Christ and says, you need, you, there are more like Christ. Paul says, no way. But listen to what else Christ and says. Write this down. Christ and says, you need more than Christ. Now, have you ever read in your Bibles? How sometimes it seems like it talks about how we are saved, and sometimes it talks about how it seems like we are going to be saved. What is it? Well, it's both. You see, in, the, in your New Testament, there is what theologians talk about as the already and the not yet. We, 
we all know there's a sense of the not yet. We are not yet sanctified fully. We are not yet relieved from all of the suffering on this planet. We are not yet in a state of perfection. We are not yet in our resurrection bodies. There's a sense in which our salvation is not yet. But the Bible says there is a sense in which it is already. We have life right now in Christ. We have the Spirit of God indwelling us. We have the new creation. We have righteousness. Already we are experiencing what we are going to fully experience in heaven. Now what Christ and does not understand is the already. It does not understand how much you have Right now in Christ. You see, philosophy contends Christ is good, but he isn't enough. You need more. And the more just depends on what the philosophy happens to be. And there were more than one kind of philosophy in, in Colossae. You ever heard people say how you just need to know more? Christ is good, but, but you need to know more. I mean, if, if that primitive view of you holding on to faith in Christ helps you get through life, well, I'm happy for you. And they take the approach of intellectualism. Paul is going to say there are people out there saying that, that you need this philosophy, but all it is is just based on human tradition. You ever heard people say that you just need to feel more? And Paul is going to say in Colossians to not get caught up with people who are worshiping angels and they tell you how much they have seen in the heavenlies. It's just idle minds filled with idle notions. You ever heard people say that you need to do more? Paul is going to say, well, don't let people tell you to, to keep the Sabbath or, or touch this or don't touch that. You see, there's intellectualism, there is mysticism, and then there is legalism. There is Always somebody out there saying you have got to do, you have got to know, or you have got to feel more. Paul says you don't need more. Christ is enough. Paul understands that the gospel is offensive to human religion. Human religion is always wanting to make its own contribution. Paul says, I don't need anything but Christ. Paul says, I have everything I need in Christ for my redemption. Look at chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Paul writes, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us, that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. I don't need anything more for my redemption than Jesus Christ. What about spiritual victory? Look at verse 15 of chapter 2. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public, public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I don't need any, any help for facing the forces of invisible darkness in the heavenly realms than just trusting in Jesus. How about spiritual growth? Look at verses 6 and 7 of chapter 2. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Hopefully that verse, those two verses kind of stick out in your mind and heart because we challenged you last year to remember these two verses and memorize them. Now, but this is real hard for us because every single parent knows what it's like to worry if your kid is growing up like he should be or maturing like he should be. And the same is true with new Christians. I want you to hear what I'm about to say. The temptation, I think, what's a great temptation is for what I would refer to as steroid spirituality. And you guys know what steroids are. A guy wants to get big. He, he, uh, he wants to grow up and be strong. Somebody says, hey, man, I can help you get strong, but in a quicker path than what you're doing. And steroids will make you seem strong fast, but ultimately they destroy you. And here is the danger. People say, you just have to do more, or you just have to feel more, or you just have to know more. They will make you look spiritual faster than simply living just day by day in Jesus. But it is ultimately very destructive. Paul is saying in Colossians, don't get caught up in steroid spirituality. Colossians, this little letter, calls us to put complete confidence in the complete adequacy and the completed work of Christ. You, you know, the only more that we need, we need more understanding of what we already have. 
So Christ and says there are more like Christ and and you need more than Christ. And, and one, of the, one of the things that happens if you buy into Christ and philosophy, Christ and says we have more than they do. Christ and spirituality inevitably, inevitably produces the haves and the have-nots. It produces a, a fellowship divided. Because some people are capable of real religion because they have more. And some just are not. And so one thing you are going to see in the book of Colossians is Paul is going to hammer home again and again that the gospel of Jesus Christ is for everybody, not just for a special few. Colossians leaves very little room for privileges that only belong to a spiritual elite. Look at verse 28 of chapter 1. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present Everyone perfect in Christ. He goes on to say in chapter 3, verse 11, Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbian, Scythian, uh, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Christ is all and is in all means. There are no have-nots in the gospel. Now, you have this message that I think needs to be held tightly by every single tradition of the Christian faith. And I, I don't care what particular doctrinal stance, uh, what, what you know it would be on almost any issue, what the church has fought over, what camp you're in, what party you're a part of. The temptation to think that we have more than they do, it still exists today. And I know folks who grew up in extremely legalistic, sectarian churches where every Sunday the message was, we are the only Christians. We are the faithful few. Spiritual arrogance and spiritual elitism is a temptation, I believe, for every group. The temptation to say, we have so much more than they do. You just pick a different more to brag about. Maybe the reason we have so much trouble being Christians only is because we have trouble trusting Christ only. We don't divide over Christ. We divide over all the more we add to him. Paul declares in this letter that you cannot get more than you have in Christ. Paul is going to help us understand who we are and he's going to help us understand where we are. Do you remember how he started this letter? You go all the way back to Colossians 1, the, the, the first part of, of verse 2. To the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. You did not learn your true address. Your true address is not Fort Des Moines Church of Christ. Or Rising Sun Church of Christ. Or Indianola Church of Christ. Or Earlham Church of Christ. It, it, that's where you are. But your true address is in Christ. And if we would learn our address, we wouldn't go looking anywhere else for what we already have at home. You may have heard of the famous Yates oil discovery. Mr. Yates in West Texas during the depression was about to lose his farm. He's about to go bankrupt. And some people said, well, let us try to find oil on your land. They did. At a very shallow depth, they found the largest oil deposit at that time in North America. Mr. Yates went from being a, a bankrupt farmer to a billionaire overnight. And here's the thing. The riches and the deposits were there the whole time. He just didn't know how to tap into them. And I hope over these next few weeks that you and I are going to learn to start tapping into everything that Christ has to offer to us as we study this incredibly precious book. You can't get more than you have in Christ. But this is very important. You can let Christ have more of you. And so we are going to see when we get to the last two chapters that Paul is going to say things like, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. He's going to say things like, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. He's going to say things like, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. You see, Christ wants to be more than just present in your life. He wants to be preeminent in your life. You don't need to seek more to be spiritual. 
But you do need, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to seek Jesus. Let me talk to you as I close this up about a very, very great song. Before I talk to you about the song, I need to tell you about the man who wrote it. Dennis Jernigan has written many songs in his career. Songs like, We Will Worship the Lamb of Glory. But one of the songs that he wrote that is my favorite of all of his works is the song, You Are My All in All. Dennis Jernigan has shared publicly many, many times that he struggled with homosexuality for all of his life. A struggle that God delivered him from in 1981. Since that point, he has gotten married and has nine children. He said, God changed my entire identity. Well, back in 1989, he led a prayer group of men at six o'clock at his church every week, one day out of the week in the morning. And as he was leading them, the thought just came to him. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I would be a fool. And as he shared With the guys, and as they started sharing back and forth, the next thing you know, he had this song in his mind and in his heart. A song that, honestly, I hope that we're going to sing a lot as we study through this precious book of Colossians. Just to remind us that when people say, is Christ enough? Or do you need more? The answer is no. We, We do not need more than Christ. He is our all in all.